Hi, welcome. I'm Stuart Chambers, a Senior Structural Engineer at ARA. I was lucky enough to be part of the Cold Rocks design team and undertook the analysis for the new roof. I was seconded to site during the construction phase and later returned to the office while the project was being fitted out. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the journey we had back when we designed this project. The now familiar form obviously didn't start out quite like this. When I joined the project and this photo was taken, 2014 I believe, the site was starting to be tidied into shape and it was clear the buildings had some serious wear and tear from their previous lives. Built in the 1850s, these brick train terminals were allegedly once the longest brick buildings in Europe. Their original function was to sort coal and aid its distribution through London, as the name would suggest. In the 1900s, the advent of electricity and other means of heat generation saw the end of the need for coal and the end of the need for the coal drops yard, at which point they started to be used for warehousing. By the 1990s, coal drops yards empty warehouses were well and truly being discovered by London's underground ravers and by 93, a series of legitimate nightclubs had started up. I'd imagine some of you might remember these. All things must come to an end, however. By 2008, the world had moved on, and the buildings were ready for a new lease of life. You can see here the Eastern Coal Drop, Western Coal Drop, and Wharf Road Arches adjacent to Regent's Canal. The longer building, the Eastern Coal Drop, Grade 2 listed, had suffered severe fire damage in 1985, leaving only freestanding masonry walls and damaged remnants of the old frame. The western coal drop and its iron viaduct lay in a similar state of disrepair. Whilst the buildings were long and large, they were for the most part regularly interrupted with masonry cross walls, dividing the space as seen on plan, giving them quite a small and cellular nature. There were multiple levels within the buildings, many of which did not align with their partner building, this obviously making level access and circulation on site a challenge. Beneath the black paint and dust, there was an abundance of beautiful building fabric, but it was certainly in need of some love. The project encompassed a huge variety of intervention, working with steel, cast iron, wrought iron, timber, masonry, concrete and glass. There was masses of restoration work undertaken, as well as the new build. As I simply wouldn't have time to discuss all the merits of this project, I'll be focusing on the new roof structure for this presentation. Argent, the developer and client, who were also responsible for the wider 70-acre King's Cross redevelopment, had hoped to reinvent the three sheds as a retail destination that would stitch together and form a focal point for the surrounding works that had been ongoing since 2008 and are expected to finish in 2021. To this end, they appointed Heatherwick Studios as the design architect. Heatherwick Studio brought a fantastic creativity to the project. It was a great time to be involved. A time full of ideas and energy. In my mind, three key drivers emerged at this time. One, this idea of placemaking, making the buildings a go-to destination that could be noticed from afar. Two, the need to create circulation, connectivity and excitement amongst the three separate buildings. And three, the need to respect and showcase the rich history the site had to offer. A fourth driver also became apparent to me. As the buildings were typically cellular in nature, being separated by masonry cross walls every six metres. There was a commercial need to create a contrastingly large floor space that could house a crowd drawing tenant. This could have been achieved by tearing out a series of cross walls within the eastern or western coal drop, but of course this would undermine the third key driver of respecting and showcasing the rich history the three buildings had to offer. And so the idea of peeling back the roofs of the east and west coal drop to form an entirely new floor plate between them at roof level was born. The concept was compelling. The new roof delicately merged contemporary and historic forms, creating an 850 square metre retail unit from thin air, complete with elevated views over London. Interestingly, the original schemes actually saw the roofs of the eastern and western coal drop buildings fully merge with one another to create a series of roof forms that would lend themselves to beautiful architecture, but most importantly from a structural perspective, would lend themselves to a low path of simple, deep and slightly curved trusses that could easily span the weight of the new floor and roof onto supports within the existing buildings. Unfortunately, in one of the early planning approval meetings, it was decided that the need to keep the eastern and western coal drop identity as separate buildings was paramount. And with that decision made, a huge structural challenge was born. That being the architectural concept of merging the roofs only so much that they just touched one another in a Michelangelo's creation of Adamesque motif, later termed the kissing point. 
This concept maintained a separate identity for each building and so allowed planning approvals to be given. It was visually compelling and maintained the ability to create a large floor plate at roof level that was so important for the commercial success of the site. But how would we solve the structural diagram? And of course not only solve it, but make it as efficient as possible and easy to build. These series of sketches from project director Ed Clark's notebook hinted what was to come. You can see here a number of ideas emerging. The idea of the truss being formed within the ribbon shape of the roofs. The idea of the floor being hung from the lower court of the ribbon trusses. And the possibility of perhaps placing some structure in the shorter spanning direction between buildings. But how to squeeze the structure through the kissing point where the roofs only just touched. The nature of the ribbon roofs was such that Heatherwick Studio wanted to see the ribbon emerge from the flat roof plane, both internally and externally. This posed challenges in resolving any structure across the kissing point and the shorter span between buildings, as it could not easily no doubt. We tried a number of ways to improve the efficiency of the structure by altering the architecture. But to their credit, Heatherwick Studio stuck to their guns and we ultimately settled on the diagram in the bottom right. And so we had a diagram. A central A-frame spanned the shortest distance between buildings while two ribbon trusses formed within the ribbon shape of the roof spanned from the corresponding building to meet at the kissing point. Together these three pieces of structure could resist the load of the new roof and also carry the weight of the new floor. The new floor was supported along its leading edge by a series of hangers that took their support from the lowest core of the ribbon trusses, while a series of steel ties housed beneath the new floor resolved lateral thrust generated by the support system ensuring a closed system that would only apply vertical loading to any support structure beneath the original roof level. We had originally desired to support all this load off the masonry walls found within the existing buildings, but when confronted with the scale of the forces, the test data on shallow foundations, and the uncertainty surrounding the historic loading, we had to surrender to the idea of placing new columns and piles within the footprint of the existing building to support these vertical loads. So in many ways we'd found a solution, one that could be honed and optimised as the design stages progressed. But we were soon to realise we had only done the easy bit. Whilst we'd resolved the forces for the overall diagram, we had yet to resolve how these forces would converge at a detail level, ensuring these details could be easily transported to site, and of course built. For instance, we had generated two 10 meganewton compressions in the A-frame that needed to resolve into a single 20 meganewton tie. 20 meganewtons is equivalent to the weight of 400 elephants. And these 400 elephants had to squeeze within 420 mil space below the floor. Working with steelwork contractor Severfield, we honed in on a solution that utilised four flat steel plates and tensioned bolts for the majority of the tie length, splitting into two only once within the existing building footprint. The main mantras were to minimise work workmanship with such thick plates, transferring load longitudinally with smaller fillet welds rather than using labour-intensive end-to-end butt welds. Where possible, we offset connections so as to limit the number of members converging on a single node, and the whole detail was broken into pieces that could fit on a 3 by 15 metre trailer so they could be transported from Bolton, where they were fabricated, to London. Equally challenging was the kissing point steelwork detail that needed to pass seemingly unnoticed through the zone where the roofs only just touched. By massaging the roof geometry, we managed to create a lozenge shape, as seen in section here in the bottom right, that could house two 1.3 meter deep kissing point steels, whilst still maintaining the visual notion that the roofs were only just touching. When 400 elephants converge in one another, you might imagine they create quite the force. Well, they did generate some eye-wateringly large bending moments, in this case requiring 80 mil thick flanges to be used. Whilst it would seem odd to allow such huge compressions to bend like this through the kissing point, it's worth remembering that by introducing this A-frame, we were able to hugely improve the efficiency of the roof structure by carrying approximately 70% of the roof load across the shortest span, this unfortunately being the only way to do it. The diagram, whilst locally inefficient, had facilitated a huge saving for the overall system, and critically for Heatherwick's, had allowed the architectural message to remain intact. Wherever possible, we tried to simplify the structure whilst keeping the architectural message, as can be demonstrated with the ribbon trusses. The trusses, by their nature, were highly three-dimensional and complex in geometry. And like all good engineers I've met, when it came down to it, 
we too seemingly had an aversion to complex geometries. So we set about finding a way that we could minimize the use of freeform curvature and set ourselves the challenge of using the least amount of bench sheeping we could to form these trusses. Using CAD software Rhino and plug-in Grasshopper, we managed to project the top, bottom and middle cord of the truss onto single 2D planes. This meant that previously multi-dimensional curves could now be defined by curves bent in one axis only, drastically simplifying the fabrication process. Next, we agreed a structural envelope with Heatherwick that would allow us to deviate the curves of the truss from their ideal position. This granting us the freedom to simplify a curve that might require over 80 separate bend radii to define into a curve that could be defined by less than 10 bend radii. Why? Again, it made fabrication easier. Less bend radii meant less bent tubes, and so less breaks in the tubing, and therefore less welding. In the end, despite the ribbon truss being very complex in nature, we managed to get away with only using curved steel tubing on the three cords of the ribbon truss. The remainder of the steelwork in the truss was fabricated from straight tubing. The hanger system is also worthy of a mention. Hung from the lower cord of the ribbon truss, supporting the front edge of the floor along the sawtooth slab edge, the hangers offered a robust means of supporting the floor. Yet when disguised within the re-entrant shape of the glazing system, offered a visual uncertainty as to how the floor was supported when viewed at first glance. We worked closely with Heatherwick's conducting a number of studies to achieve the optimum grid for hangers and glazing, aiming to allow the hangers to visually blend in. To maximise adjustability on site, we designated that every hanger would have its own floor beam. The hangers could be moved positionally on plan at the top and bottom through simple connection details. In theory, if time permitted, this would allow almost infinite adjustment to the height of the floor and the plan location of the hanger when we got to site. The challenges didn't end when we got to site, however. As simple as it may seem, we still had gravity to contend with. Jokes aside, if we wanted to achieve the building geometry shown in blue here, we would of course need to fabricate the steelwork and prop it in the shape shown in green, so that when depropped and loaded by gravity it would deform to the blue shape. Usually this isn't so critical, as would be the case for some long span roofs or bridges, where you can just allow the structure to deform. However, in this instance, as we had glazing that was being manufactured months in advance, cut to millimetre perfection, and this would only fit within the blue geometry, of course there should be some site tolerance to accommodate misalignment, but geometric constraints on the roof were limiting the ability for on-site tolerance to a fraction of the expected roof deformation. As you'd imagine, this put considerable pressure on, the, on our ability to accurately predict how the roof would move under load. I was lucky enough to be on site during this time, where we surveyed the steelwork position as the frame was erected and bolted together on a series of temporary trestles. Once the main load-bearing components of the roof were bolted together, we proceeded to lower the trestles, inducing gravitational load into the structure, causing it to deform towards the desired geometry. We had of course run a series of analysis models in the weeks prior to this, mimicking the exact sequence that would be undertaken when the roof was assembled and loaded through the depropping regime. To ensure accuracy, we recalibrated these models with the positional survey data during the process, allowing us to accurately position the steelwork as the stages of assembly and loading rolled out. We continued to monitor the roof deformation as the floor slab was poured, roof slates were laid, and further loading was applied. This allowed us to ensure the roof was performing exactly as expected as the construction progressed. Despite coming across a few initial hiccups, we managed to install the roof and floor within the agreed tolerances. And to everyone's satisfaction, that glass did manage to fit without any difficulties. A few months worth of fit out passed and the building was complete. To our surprise, it turned out looking exactly like the renders after everyone's hard work. In my office, I've been asked a number of times, but with all that steel that was required for the transformation, was it that sustainable? And before you wonder the same question, I'd like to give you an insight. Whilst we have always focused on material efficiency, at the time we weren't in the habit of defining this in terms of embodied CO2. And after being asked this question a few times, I wanted to find out for myself. So we ran the numbers and worked out that averaged over the footprint of the buildings the structure and new foundations 
came to a total of 240 kilograms embodied CO2 per square meter for stages A1 to 5. This is less than that of a typical new build retail building. I was quite surprised by this and it really did highlight to me the importance of reuse. By choosing to refurb, by giving all these existing materials and structure a new lease of life, we were granted the liberty of being able to build a structure that had less embodied carbon and one that was far from typical. In my eyes, we did more than just breathe new life into these heritage assets. Our influence extending further than merely creating an ambitious structural diagram or an exciting piece of architecture. We transform this space into a destination that will act as a catalyst for new life within this area of London. Thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed the story. I'd also like to thank Ketherick Studio, Van Construction, Severfield, Argent, and all those who I haven't mentioned who helped make this project a reality.